Hold on. Do you have any idea what you've diddly darn done? The fizz the pit suck that a sink! You done diddly broke the copyright law. What's that? You're gonna learn about international copyright laws as it pertains to music today. My interpretation of copyright would be after somebody puts a lot of work into something and somebody else just takes credit for it without mentioning them. Well, I know that, that uh, things are copyrighted, uh, personal uh, property, uh, creative things like music and, and recordings and, and uh, compositions. They're covered by the copyright law that protects them from, from being uh, misused and, and, uh, and make sure that those artists that create these things get their creative due, whether it be financial due or... or um, their name recognition. And, and so it, it, it affects me as a band director because, of course, we deal with, with copyrighted music. If I purchase music that's covered copyright, I'm okay. But there's a lot of gray areas um, in, in that um, I need to use things sometimes in a class setting that um, uh, fall into a kind of a gray area. If I want to play a recording for a class, you know, I have to make sure that they, they that it falls under what they call the fair use for education part of, of the copyright law, meaning I don't uh, really don't abuse what I'm doing. For example, if I copy, if I buy a piece of music, but I want to, I personally like to copy it and give the copies to the students rather than the originals because the kids use the originals uh, or lose the originals and it costs us more money. I think that's a gray area that can be under the Fair Use Act. As long as I make sure I collect up the copies, I don't let anybody keep them, and, and I destroy them at the end of the year. I don't keep them in the library um, um, uh, for another use somewhere down the road. Uh, uh, and, and I'm kind of a stickler for that because I really want those composers to make a living. Um, when I uh, do anything like for a marching band, um, if, if I want to a couple years ago, we did a show that we wanted to play a song uh, by um, the Rolling Stones. And I had to contact the people that had that copyright, and, and they gave us the right, we paid a fee, to copy it for a marching band rather than a, a rock band like the Rolling Stones are. So there's lots of things that we have to, we have to be careful of. Uh, I can record a show that we do, but only for keeping it as an archive. Or, or using it in the classroom is okay. We this is our show and uh, this is our performance, and we can see what we did well and what we didn't do well. But I can't. I'm not supposed to sell them, which I don't, uh, or things like that. So it's a big deal for teachers. Well, for music in particular, copyright law all sort of falls in this nebulous fair use area, where I. Uh, we understand that to mean one of a couple of things as it relates to printed music, uh, that it's acceptable to photocopy small portions of a piece, to use them for specifically educational means, uh, to not perform with photocopies. Uh, same kind of deal with recordings. It's acceptable to make an archival video or audio recording of music that uh, you're performing, but you can't sell it or distribute it or make a whole bunch of copies without getting specific permission from publishers and, in general, paying for that permission. Um, how does that affect us? I mean, I, I, it means that we spend a lot of time on the phone with publishing companies to make sure that we're uh, using those materials appropriately. Um, there have been some kind of significant court cases with, like, marching bands in particular in recent years of Virginia Tech where they really get nailed when they use stuff in ways it's not intended to be used. It's illegal. I mean, flat, flat out, it's, it's illegal. And I know that's very prevalent in today's society, and people say, why should I buy this? I can download it for free. But it's illegal. That's the bottom line. You're breaking the law. And, and the, there are um, 
lots of people that we don't hear about it locally or you might hear about it locally, you know, because I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of cases, but they go after lawbreakers and, and they will catch people. And there's big fines that can be um, uh, court cases and things like that. And a lot of people settle out of court so you don't hear about them because they don't want the hassle of going to court, but they end up paying lots of money to fines. But I, I just tell students, it's, it, it's, it's illegal. It, you know, it, it's like anything else. If you, wanna, if you wanna steal somebody's other stuff, you wouldn't think about it because, oh, you know, that's illegal to, to, to steal somebody's book or to steal somebody's car or to steal somebody's instrument or things like that. Well, this is tangible stuff too. Music is tangible and, and these guys create this and this is how they make a living. Um, and it's not like it's, you can't find places where, you, I mean, in my day, young kid, you know, you paid uh, money, you bought an album, uh, and that's how you got the music. You didn't download anything, so uh, um, now 99 cents to download a song. I mean, goodness gracious, uh, they make it easy for you um, to get what you want, but it's illegal. And, and don't be illegal, don't break the law. Well, I've had several that, that, that have been good, you know, as far as, like I said, you know, we want to, I've arranged music um, uh, that, um, for different groups that, yeah, I followed the, the rules. You went and got a copyright via, um, from the, the, either the, the, the uh, publishing company or the composer or something like that, and, and you use the copyright, um, and, it, and it's really cool uh, to, to be able to use that. In, in, in either a, a performance setting or a classroom setting. Uh, of course, there is this one time, and it, 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 I can laugh about it now, but I, I, at the time, it was really scary. Um, I uh, was in the Army band. I was a commander of an Army band, and um, we, uh, this was several years ago, 80s, so yeah, a lot of years ago. And the song, God Bless the USA by Lee Greenwood had just come out. And of course, this was a big hit. Everybody loved this song. And, um, and, and uh, in the Army Band, we used to, and of course the copyright applies to them as well, but we used to copy things or, or, or make arrangements of things just to play for soldiers, you know, just within our community. And, and most people were, okay, yeah, you're supporting the troops, you're supporting the soldiers and no problem. But we got asked to play this uh, performance at the Opryland Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee for the um, Secretary of the Army and a bunch of dignitaries. And, and we had to present a, about a 30-minute patriotic concert at the end of their dinner. And um, I had arranged this piece off of the record because it had just come out and nobody had arranged it yet for band. And I had a pretty good singer in the band and some, and some good people. And, and, and we, you know, we had done it for the troops on, on base uh, at, at troop support concerts. And, and they, of course, they love it because they love the popular stuff. And God Bless USA was very patriotic and, and uh, fit the bill really well. Well, we were doing this concert and everybody liked the band and it was fine. And, and we played patriotic music and we played some other stuff. And, and I finished the, 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 the concert with that piece uh, and then I went, in, of course, to the Army song and some other stuff. And um, afterwards, um, the uh, general who was in, in charge came up and thanked me and thanked the band. He said, could you guys play an encore for us? And I said, sure, we, we've got some stuff. And we played an encore, maybe Stars and Stripes and Forever or something like that. And unbeknownst to me, he had sent his aid out to another part of the hotel. And at, we got done with the uh, encore, in walked Lee Greenwood, a uh, very famous country pop artist, uh, you know, um, even today. He's still touring. He still does a lot of stuff for the troops. Um, he had, was in the hotel doing a, a, a benefit for the USO. And the general come up on stage and said, you know, we got this great band here that did a great job and, and, and they did Mr. Greenwood's song and we knew he was in the building and we thought maybe what, what better thing to do to have him come in and sing with this band. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to jail because I didn't get copyright permission to do this arrangement. Holy cow. So he comes up on stage and kind of glances at me, says, uh, what key do you do it in? I said, well, I don't know, F or B flat, whatever. He, he said, okay, I can do that. And so... So we start the song and I'm just, you know, just red in the face, embarrassed because, oh, this is terrible. 
And he sings, and of course it was super. Uh, during the solo in the middle where the instruments were playing, he looked over me and winked and said, really nice arrangement. Uh, I mean, if I could have just fallen into a hole, I would have. Well, after the show, he came up and he said, don't worry about it. He said, I know you're concerned. He says, anytime you want to use my music for the troops, he said, I know you're not making money off of it. This is great. And so he sent me a nice letter and a picture later on and it made me feel good. But yeah, I did, I did skirt the law there and, and, and anybody else could have said, you know, you're in trouble. But made it through and, and makes me extra special, care, careful not to do that kind of stuff in the future. So I've uh, never gotten in trouble for usage or anything along those lines. But again, we spend an awful lo- a lot of time on the phone with our publishing companies and our distributors and BMI and ASCAP and those sorts of places, making sure that we're using stuff the way that we're supposed to. I think in 2016, we live in a world where if we go about that the wrong way or you arrange stuff without permission or you're making a whole bunch of photocopies where you're kind of setting yourself up for a lot of trouble. Um, no, actually, one of the things that I found interesting in recent years is that I think it's it's getting easier to get permission to do these things. So I was just the other day arranging a piano guy's tune uh, for string orchestra, and I called their publishing company, and it took less than ten minutes to get permission to arrange the thing. And even when I wanted to send it to my publisher to see if there was any possibility that it would be something that other people wanted to buy, I mean, it was less than a hundred dollars to pay for the rights to the thing and it, nothing to arrange it and give it to my kids. It was was the easiest process I've been through, I think, ever with regard to copyright. Uh, I've seen it in a small scale just in school with people copying other people's homework and copying papers word for word. And then there have been times where I've seen it in like big media cases where stuff like Napster before in the past, like taking music and putting it out for other people to listen to. Well, again, the basic law is, you know, that, that, that songs and, and, and music um, that, that is published has a copyright and it lasts, you know, for as long as, I'm not sure, some of it, you know, the old stuff goes into public domain after so many years. Um, and, and, and again, it's just, it's material that's protected by the law from uh, infringement and, and um, use that's not uh, according to that, to that law. If, you know, if I buy it from a local publisher, I buy a lot of my stuff um, from uh, publishing companies, well, I buy all the stuff from publishing companies, and that automatically uh, guarantees that they're copyrighted because a lot of the publishers work for those, uh, a lot of the composers work directly with the publishing companies. Uh, I have a good friend of mine from the Army days, he, he retired and became a really fine composer, and that's his secondary career now, and we talk a little bit, and um, uh, he... Um, uh, he's connected with um, um, a music company down in Texas, and, and he works for him. And so his stuff, when he writes it, they license it for him. And it helps him because they help pay for the licensing fees, and it, and it helps them because they have a good publisher, a good good composer that, that they can publish his music and people want to buy it. Uh, it's a one-step process. You get online and you purchase it. And when you purchase uh, educational music, so the stuff that you guys play in band or the stuff that I play in orchestra or the stuff that the choruses sing, uh, educational music comes with an unprinted, sort of unwritten copyright license. You're allowed to perform those things in an educational setting, provided that you're not charging people for the tickets. So if I decided that I wanted to do that same material as a fundraising concert, then you'd have to call a publisher and say, hey, I'm charging five bucks a ticket. You know, is that okay? And in general, there would be some kind of licensing fee that goes along with it in the same way that there would be for like renting a musical or another theatrical production. But uh, when we purchase music just for our classes to use, they put it in the mail and send it to you and you're allowed to perform from there. Sometimes it depends on what you want to do. So there are some specific thing, some specific genres that are a little harder to find. So, for example, if you want to play John Williams, but you want to play arrangements of John Williams that are school level appropriate, that is a challenging thing to find. Um, but there is so much educational music out there now that you can 
even if it's not necessarily your dream arrangement or composition of something, you can almost always find what you're looking for. Well, there's sometimes that we want to use certain things, just like God bless the USA back in those days, and it's just not published. So, you know, you don't want to stretch that. Um, uh, so you have to wait for it to come out. Um, you have to, I think another thing is that uh, that I deal with is, is that fair use uh, part of, of the law, which makes sure I don't, you know, am I, am I really in line with that or am I pushing the limits? And I try not to do that. So I keep a track of, like I said, keep track of things that I copy. I, I go through the library. If I'm pulling the piece of music out that I haven't used in a long time and I see copies in it, I take those copies and I throw them away. So that's an ongoing process. Well, I mean, it, if, if it's been copyrighted originally, there's a, there's a statute of limitations, no, I don't know, statute of limitations, there's a time limit unless you renew the copyright. There are people that you can renew the copyright, but there are times when people don't renew copyrights and, and they just let it go to public domain. You know, a lot of the, the, the classical music, uh, early jazz music, things like that that might have been copyrighted. Um, they, they now, and you can arrange them like you want, you can use them like you want. But any of the current stuff is going to be, that's, that's, that's under that, it's still copyrighted. That part is, is pretty simple. It, it, you go to the publisher. Um, it, if it's out of print, you can get permission. Like a few years ago, we played a piece here in the band for state assessment. And it was out of print. And for state assessment, you have to provide three original scores. Um, and of course, being out of print, I mean, we still had the music, but I only had one score. So I contacted the music company and they sent me a letter that gave me permission to copy those scores three times, just for three copies, for that particular assessment. Now, if I ever want to use that again, uh, I have to go back and get permission again. So if it's out of print, you can still use it, but you, you again, you got to ask for permission. Um, uh, and even being out of print, it's still under copyright you're not really supposed to. So in general, once we purchase music, it's acceptable to copy a couple of bars here and there for a seating audition or something similar, but it wouldn't be the kind of thing where you could reproduce the entire piece. Well, mostly with like me being super in like the music industry and whatnot, I've seen a lot of people like steal music and like download it illegally. And then there's also, you know, the kind with like if there's like a logo or something and someone like, and it's already like trademarked and stuff and then people take it and like use it, like that that idea of that logo and using it for something else, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I've heard of, of like this one composer, um, um, a Dutch composer who wrote, uh, writes a lot of great music and his company, uh, and every co major publishing company does this, they will uh, uh, search the internet for um, illegal use. And they come across a band, a high school band, uh, and I don't want to mention the name on, on camera, but um, uh, this band had arranged their, his music, one of his symphonic pieces, for a marching band show and uh, had not received permission. Uh, I believe this happened in the late 90s. And the lawyers sent a letter to the band and the school district and said, well, we really appreciate that you liked our composer's music so much, but you know this is not constituting legal use. And they were fined hundred thousand dollars of performance well they did 11 performance so that's 1.1 million dollars that this school district was fined now from what I understand uh, of course they renegotiated it and you know because again um, sometimes it's out of ignorance which is no excuse but when they when they find that and you know they'll they'll say okay yeah here's a slap on the wrist don't do it again with something like that um, but I, I've heard of instances like that from uh, uh, especially with marching band uh, because you know you want to do different kinds of things 
but you got to follow the law. Yeah, it, it, it's not any more difficult. You contact the, the each publishing company has an office of, of licensure, and and they and you you contact them and, and and you go and say I would like to use this music, and you tell them what for, what music, what for, and how much of it, how you're going to use it, and generally it's it's a, a nominal fee. It's not real exorbitant, um, depending on how much you want to use. Um, you know, uh, good luck. You're not going to use anything from Disney. They, they don't license much. But it's not that difficult if you, you, know, you go through it. And most of the band directors that I know in this area that write original or use copyrighted material have no difficulty getting that. Yeah, um, there's not too much permanently out of print stuff in orchestra land. Um, I was looking the other day at the Benjamin Britten Simple Symphony, which is now uh, a piece that went from being public domain to being back under copyright, and then just recently to being a rental piece, a rental piece only, which is weird when you want to take it to festival or something like that because a rental fee is way, way more than what it costs to purchase the piece outright. You know, it'll be hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Um, but technically, a whole bunch of us have the Britain in our library because it was at one point under under uh, uh, um, in the public domain, and then later uh, a piece that you could purchase. Um, and it's a little hard to figure out sort of where you how you address that, you know, what what it's acceptable to do or not do, or where you perform it or where you don't. Um, I would say the only thing with music that's permanently, permanently, permanently out of print is that most of it is public domain. And so you can find it someplace else. You know, you're looking at like Mozart de Vermenti or something like that. You can generally find them on IMSLP or something similar. Um, orchestra pieces are typically between 50 and maybe 75 bucks a piece band music more like a hundred bucks just because there's more parts to the things um choral music they actually don't sell by the set they sell it by the piece since the piano part and the uh, vocal parts and all that kind of thing are all in the same octavo and those are usually like a buck or a buck 25 per chart <laughs> Again, they, uh, once you copy, you know, the music that you get rights to copyright, you tell them what you're using it for. If you use it outside that, then there might be some difficulties, but that's pretty loose. I mean, if you use a marching band show, you've got a football game, an exhibition, competition, you know, you say, I'm going to do this show or that show, and, and then you add a show later on, that's generally not a problem. Um, it's just, again, for schools, um, it's just, you're not making money off of it for the most part. As far as I know, I've never seen another teacher report copyright violation uh, with regards to another teacher. I would assume that if that was something that you wanted to do, that it would be pretty easy to just figure out the publisher for whatever the piece in question was and to drop them an email. As far as I know, there are no like copyright infringement hotlines, but there are certainly email addresses and customer service uh, contacts for all these people. <laughs> As far as I know, most copyright infringement uh, repercussions are just a monetary fine, but I suspect that, you know, something significant enough could result in imprisonment or something like that. I don't think that would be something really, like, intense to, like, throw them in jail or something, but I would think, like, putting fines and, like, getting a little bit more strict about it because it's not a strict thing at all. For someone who breaks copyright laws, uh, for something like that, I feel like they d definitely deserve jail time for that. Maybe not an extensive amount, like up to five years possibly, but yeah, after someone puts a lot of hard work into something and tries really hard to make it perfect, then yeah, that should definitely be something. Sure, absolutely. Well, I mean, there, that's what... That's how, that's how composers and arrangers and publishers make their money. So, you know, that's certainly protecting artistic integrity and making sure that these people have careers, that they have a way to support themselves. Um, I mean, I think in general, copyright 
law is only problematic in that it's not very clear. Uh, you know, the, the laws exist to protect people, uh, but particularly with regards to educational copyright, it's just hard to know exactly what's acceptable and what's not. It's pretty murky, pretty gray. Biggest benefit, of course, is, is the, 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 the artists, um, they own that work. It's just like owning a car or owning, you, you know, you build a car, you build something else, and, and um, the artist owns it, and they, and they should have the right to that. So um, um, that, that's the big deal right there. And, and of course, financial compensation. This is their li livelihood. These people, um, uh, they don't have day jobs. They, they, they're composers or, or performers if, if you're using a, somebody's uh, performance song. And so you're taking money from their, uh, from their bank accounts. So that's the biggest thing. But also, you know, the, they deserve the credit. This is their creation. It, it just by, and so they deserve the credit for that. You don't have to worry about somebody taking your work and not mentioning you in it or giving you credit for it. And I feel like that's a big part of, that's a big benefit of copyright laws. <laughs> point where everybody understands that it's technically illegal to copy music. Um, what I would love to see are some clearer, again, some clearer national copyright guidelines, particularly sort of as they relate to fair use, a specific list of here are things that you may do and here are things that you may not do. You know, we're a lot more likely to follow rules when they say you can and you can't as opposed to you probably shouldn't. We tend to ignore probably shouldn'ts or probably shoulds as you know to sort of serve our own interests you know, the, I think we have a pretty good system in place um, the laws I think have, have proven to be pretty fair uh, they also um, uh, are always being looked at and, and changed in light of new technology that you know we have a lot of new technology and they're trying to make sure that that uh, that the laws stay current with that kind of stuff but uh, you know, without it, you just, you've taken, like I say, livelihoods away from people. So that's the biggest, uh, the biggest benefit. So, did you learn anything here today, boy?